those items in the pouch in front of you. Have a safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. Today, we've got a great chat with Rob from the YouTube channel Rob Plays. If you've ever been diving through YouTube looking for Disney-related content, there's a good chance Rob's channel has popped up. Focusing on park trivia and history, Rob has used his video skills to educate thousands on all sorts of topics related to the parks, from why the water rides smell the way they do, to the origins of the infamous Beverly Soda, to where the heck all that theme park trash goes after you throw it in the bin. Rob covers everything, but his journey into YouTube filmmaking actually began with a little game called Minecraft. We talk about that, as well as him taking a giant leap of faith and quitting his job to take on his channel full-time. All of that and more is coming right up on DreamFinders. Rob, thanks for coming on DreamFinders. I appreciate it. Uh, Thanks for having me. So you're known online for your history of Disney videos, uh, among other things, but few of us know anything about your actual history. Um, Where did you grow up? Where are you from? Uh, so I was born in New York City. I, I was grew up in Queens, New York. I spent a couple of years in college uh, in Brooklyn living with family. And then after college, I ended up moving back to Queens. So I've been pretty local to New York uh, this whole time. Born and bred. Yep. So what kind of um, creative kid were you? Uh, clearly, you have um, things that you are doing now. But what were your outlets when you were younger? Oh, I mean, if we go back really young, like I, I, I remember I used to have like, um, a disposable camera and I would take, um, Star Wars action figures and Mm -hmm. I would essentially storyboard stories in my head using the camera and I would like set up the action figures. So it's weird. My interest in video didn't really start, I'd say fully until like the eighth grade. But even before that, I was just like always playing around with action figures Um, But when I was in the eighth grade, we had this English course where you had to essentially write and act a short like three page play. And I don't even remember if there was like a theme or anything. But all I do remember is that like me and the other kids in my group were terrified of this idea of acting in front of the class. (laughs) So we asked our teacher if we could instead do a claymation because we had seen claymation. So we thought, obviously, we know how to make claymation (laughs) just because we saw it. And uh, surprisingly, uh, she approved it. And so we had like an extra couple of weeks and we did a claymation. And that claymation ended up being really awful, unsurprisingly. Mm. But showing it to like the class and like all the, these kids are like super interested in seeing like that we had created this thing. And at that moment I was like, wow, like this was really fun. Getting to make something and show it to people was really fun. And so that really kicked off this love of video and then later specifically film that sort of just kept growing through like high school. And then eventually I went to film school and in college and, uh, it just became like that medium where I love this idea of not just telling stories, but telling stories for other people to enjoy. So were you making short films and things of that nature with friends in high school and things of that nature beforehand after, after this assignment, did you catch the bug and kind of play around with it then? Oh, for sure. I, I, when it, when it really started, um, I ended up discovering like this bundled in editing software that came with something else. And it was like a really like no name software. And so I think when it really started, it was the editing that I loved. And I would use like all the stock footage that came with the software and I would make like fake commercials for fake products. Uh, But then whenever we could, my friends and I would get together and we'd we would never write anything out. We would just meet up that day and go like, all right, let's make up a story. And we would wing the entire thing. And, you know, they were all levels of terrible the way it kind of always is when you're young and you're first getting into that sort of thing. But there was something about the whole process that was really fun that when you walk away at the end of the day or a couple of days when you're putting it together and you have this final product, it's like you made this out of nothing. And so, you know, I knew when I was in high school, like, I want to be a director. I want to go to film school. I want to become a director. I want to make movies. And then uh, I ended up 
doing that to the extent that I went to film school. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as uh, fate would have it, I think it was like the month before I graduated. I was like, actually, I don't want to be a director and I don't want to work in movies because I had been doing that uh, in between semesters. I'd been working on like independent and Mm -hmm. student film sets, uh, but I knew I still wanted to be in media. And it sort of went back to that first discovery, which was editing. And that was really the one thing that was just constant throughout all of those years i loved getting on the computer and taking all of this footage whether we had shot it or we had grabbed it from somewhere else and being able to manipulate it to create a story like that was just always the most fun and also like you didn't have to go outside in the freezing cold and or anything so i like that over being on set um was mostly production and, and having to be on production the reasons why you sort of strayed away from the director's chair or was there uh, any sort of creative reasons you just didn't think that was uh, a fit for you uh i think it was a couple of things like i i think the production part really added to it i mean getting a taste of working like in production was definitely an eye opener for me like i had summers where you know, I didn't know when the next paycheck was mm. going to come in and you have to, you know, you get a job that morning and suddenly you have to drop all your plans. And so it's a very, I think, uh, difficult uh, field to get into at first, just from a day to day perspective. Mm-hmm. But I also felt like there was a lot of um, there wasn't a lot of room to move over. Like I I started as a PA and then I eventually got into like grip and electric setting up lights and stuff. And that was great. But I never at any point felt like, well, this experience setting up lights, this is what's going to get me ready for being a director. Like it felt like the path to become a director was you had to essentially save up a bunch of money, start making your own shorts, hope they go somewhere. And really the production stuff was just to, you know, pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that just didn't seem like a path I wanted to take. And then when you combine that with, you know, I, I, I enjoyed creating these stories, but I wasn't enough of a writer that I felt like I could make my own stories. Mm. And I feel like you have to get to a point where, you know, somebody's willing to just give you their story to create for them. Um, and so it was just sort of like this, it was like this almost perfect storm where I was like, I I didn't have like this tale. I felt like I needed to tell through film. I really wanted a steady job. And, you know, uh, I ended up just falling into this position in online media that kind of opened my eyes to just how much of a bigger audience is out there when you're talking about something like YouTube, as opposed to, you know, film. I remember spending an entire year working on my senior thesis film And we got to show it at like our school's film festival. Mm -hmm. And that was like this crazy moment where I was like, there are like 300 people in this theater and they're all watching this movie I made. This is amazing. But, you know, now I look back on it and you see the kind of audience you could grab on YouTube and that just feels like nothing. So Mm -hmm. I kind of never looked back and thought like, well, film something I I need to go and revisit. It was it was something I was gladly I was really just happy to look forward towards like online media. So let's talk a little bit about um your relationship with Disney. Um, Mm -hmm. What was your um, level of fandom at a young age? Uh, I think I was, I would say it was pretty high from before I could even remember. Uh, My, my mom was like sort of raised like the Disney family. They went, Mm. I think she was a teenager when Disney world opened. And so they, they often went on family trips. And so by the time I was born, I would, we were already going to family trips, you know, every other year or so. So I, I mean, it was a big part of my life. We had the VHS tapes at home. We had, you know, the, the toys and everything. It was just always there. And what's funny is, Uh, I ended up going to a uh, private high school and because of that, we really couldn't afford to go to Disney during my teenage years. Mm. And I always thought to myself, like, those are when I feel like when you're a teenager, that's when you're most cynical and, you know, you think you're really cool. You're cooler than everything. So like those four or five years where I probably would have fallen out of love with Disney, I never had to go or I never went. So I never had that you know, opportunity to fall out of love with it. Mm. And then college rolled around and I started going back again and I loved it as much as when I was a kid and it just kept growing from there. So it's been around since, you know, day one. Do you have early, early memories of the parks, things that we no longer have there that sort of reside in your brain? Uh, Horizons. Mm. Horizons is like so burned into my memory. Uh, Horizons and then very specifically the old 
ending of Spaceship Earth before they removed all the scenes and replaced it with the Judy Dench version. Mm-hmm. I remember like uh, the scenes with the video conference calling. Like I attribute, I'm a big sci-fi person. I love technology and looking to the future, and I really do credit that to Epcot, like that early 80s, mid 80s uh, Epcot. Um, and those are the things that I that and also I want oddly enough Delta's dream flight was one that's like really burned into my memory. That's like one of the ones where I feel like most people don't miss it. But I those three rides just those are the ones I remember the most vividly from when I was a kid. You mentioned Epcot and, and you've mentioned in um, some videos that Epcot's your your favorite park. Um, does that remain true? And why, why do you think that is? Um, it, it does remain true. It's kind of lessening every year. And I don't think it actually has to do with the changes. I, I, it's been like a very, um, hot topic. I think over the last few years within the community of like, what is Epcot supposed to be? Mm. And, you know, are these upcoming changes, things like the guardians coaster, do they align with Epcot or, you know, is this Disney sort of losing their vision? Um, I, I always loved it because yeah, it was a positive it was an optimistic outlook of the future. And, you know, I always uh, note that Spaceship Earth, specifically the Jeremy Irons version, is my favorite version of my favorite attraction ever. And it's because there's this line of dialogue at the end. It's like after you see the Earth, you know, he poses this question. It says, will this flood of information be, you know, techno babble or will we use it to uh, usher in a new renaissance? And I love the idea that it offered this vision of an optimistic future, but it also put that responsibility on you that said, it's up to you to make this an Mm. optimistic future. You know, Disney is not going to be able to do it. Like the, the power is in your hands to, you know, make it happen. And you see it with, you know, horizons. If you could dream it, you can do it. Like that sort of optimism really resonated with me. And, um, Realistic optimism, right? Realistic. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. It's not the kind where like everything's going to work out great. You don't have to worry about it. It's just, you know, you, you can make it happen. You just got to put in that work. And I hope that message exists, continues to exist at some level in Epcot. I've come to terms with the idea that over time, the the business model and, and who's running the ship kind of that changes things and, and, you know, working things like IP into the parks is just bound to happen. But mm-hmm. as long as there's some level of that, you know, the future can be great. You just have to make it so then Epcot will be still my favorite part. Yeah, Magic Kingdom was always, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow, and, and Epcot always had that vibe of, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow, maybe, if if you, <laughs> if you participate. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, so when do you go from, uh, you know, there is a distinct difference between loving the parks, going to the parks, um, you know, maybe even owning some souvenirs, and, you know, reading in-depth you know, histories of, um, corporate synergy and, you know, (laughs) Eisner and, um, you know, what happens when, when did that sort of transition occur for you? Um, I would say it was, it was probably about six years ago or so. It was, I was at that point had finished college. I was kind of out on my own. So I, you know, was working full time and it was just like post college graduate, you know, income. So I wasn't going to Disney very often just because I simply couldn't afford to. And so I was trying to find other outlets to kind of get that Disney escape without being able to actually go to Disney. And as I was getting older, I was starting to appreciate more and more of the work that goes into creating a place so fully immersive. Like I, I, I recognized from a very like young age because my mom was always talking about the cast members, how they're the ones who do this. And that made me think about how, you know, this place is run like a small city. It's, it's, I can't even begin to imagine all of the gears that are moving to make this place work day in and day out. And so it was just like one day or six years ago or so where I was like, I wonder if there's a book that talks about that. That's not about the magic or, you know, the, the cartoon characters or anything like that, but like the logistics that go into this park. 
Mm. And that's when I found um, Reality Land by David Koenig. Mm. And I read it and I loved it. And just getting that, like, I found myself surprisingly interested in things like union disputes and, you know, overhead costs for construction and things like that. Uh, I don't know if it's because I love the place so much and I was able to appreciate everything that went into it or just because I started to grow to appreciate how, you know, uh, an organization that large works. But uh, after that book, I was just was like a sponge and I was like, what other books can I find? And that's when I stumbled upon Disney war and all these mm-hmm. other books. And I just kept reading for fun and it wouldn't be another year or so until I would find like an actual outlet to kind of tell those stories again through video. So let's talk about, um, where you're at before you kind of find this outlet. A part of your story deals with video games and your involvement in what is sort of known as the let's play video movement for those olds that might be listening. Maybe give us a little explanation of what let of what let's play is. Sure. Uh, essentially it's the idea of a personality playing a video game in real time and either at the time they're playing provide commentary, uh, usually like entertainment commentary. Uh, Sometimes they'll do it after the fact and they'll dub it over the video game footage. And then in some instances, it'll be like useful commentary, like this is how you beat this boss or do this or that. But for the most part, it's just joking around. And I liken it to almost like Mystery Science Theater 3000 Mm. for video games. Like you're trying (laughs) to be fun and funny while you're playing a game. And uh, I had gotten into that because I worked for this company called Howcast, and they did a lot of uh, how-to videos on the internet, and I uh, was a post-production person there. Eventually, they wanted to get into video games, and I was the second youngest person at the office, so I was like, I'll get involved. I play video games all the time. And so I was a producer there for a while with their video game channel, and they wanted to try out Let's Plays, and so I figured, you know what? This seems like it'd be fun. Let me do that. And so um, I did a Minecraft Let's Play series for about a year with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that started to wrap up, it looked like it wasn't something they wanted to continue, but I had enjoyed doing it. So I thought to myself, you know what? Let me make my own video game channel. I'll do it on the side for everything that they don't want to do. And that's when I created Rob Plays That Game, which was for the first, I want to say, two years or so, or uh, maybe like a year and a half, it was like exclusively video game content. Mm-hmm. Uh, why do you think people enjoy watching others play video games? What's what's the draw? I think that's an actual like really interesting question because I think one of the main reasons I dropped out of it is for a long time I couldn't even answer that question. <laughs> like people would ask me like, well, what Let's Players do you watch? And the answer was I didn't watch any because mm-hmm. I didn't find Let's Plays that interesting. Um, but I think... I think a big part of it is is connecting with that personality. You know, it's uh, one of the common um, one of the common ideas that I think is talked about uh, often between people who make Let's Plays is that really people are coming for the personality. Mm-hmm. They can see footage of a video game anywhere. They can look that up. You know, and there's plenty of just plain, you know, vanilla footage of that game. Uh, they're they're coming because they they grow to that personality. They grow attached and they want to almost it's like a digital version of hanging out with them without actually hanging out with them. So I think that's what it's made it grow so much. What about Minecraft, though, really worked for you? Because Minecraft, I mean, was it just the game that they wanted you to cover? Or um, what is it about Minecraft that you think brings people so much together? Um, it was definitely uh, my involvement with Minecraft. It was like twofold because I was a big video game player at the time. So I, I enjoyed Minecraft just for playing it at the time, but the company definitely wanted to get involved because at that point it was exploding. And I think it was exploding in popularity because it really was a sandbox world. Mm-hmm. You could do anything with it. You could have a series where you're just trying to survive. There are series all about building and the creativity of building. And uh, for me, what kept me in it for so long, you know, because I, I feel like when I play video games, I tend to play them. And then a couple of months later, I'll move on to something else. But I was playing Minecraft for years because um, there's just I think infinite possibilities. So many people were modding it in so many different ways that, you know, you can get bored with Minecraft, but like six months Mm -hmm. later, there's a whole different way to play the game and it feels fresh and new. And I imagine for a lot of younger players, you know, I remember being younger and playing video games. You don't necessarily have the resources to just move on to the next game. So if you're going to have that one game that's Mm going to hold you over for six months or a year, might as well go with something that that's, that's that flexible. And, um, there just happened to be this perfect marriage of Minecraft and Disney that ended up happening. That was like probably the luckiest thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. Let's explore that in a little bit. Um, 
on August 19th, 2012 is when you posted your epilogue uh, for your Let's Play Minecraft series on Howcast. And I think it was probably your last video because you mentioned, um, I have this new channel I'm working on. Um, I don't know what the title, you, you, I think you say, if I remember correctly, I don't know what the title is, but it's probably, I'm going to play whatever I want to play. Rob plays this, Rob plays that. And it's really funny that you sort of ended up just with Rob plays. Um, you sound a bit down in the video though. Um, a little bit like you mentioned your sort of exhaustion with Minecraft and, and maybe a little bit with Let's Play. Where were you at creatively at that time? Um, I was definitely far more over Minecraft than Let's Plays mm. as a whole. Uh, I, that was definitely one of those periods where and if I think if you look at the beginning of Rob Plays That Game, I, it took me a while before I'd get back into Minecraft because I just didn't want to play the game mm. anymore. And it's, you know, playing that same, I was playing just sort of the regular base survival game. And at that point I had been playing for over a year. And so I was just kind of tired with it. Um, I still loved video games at that point, And I was really excited at the idea of moving on to other games because, you know, creating those videos, it takes time to play the game, but then you're also, you know, you got to run through it again. You got to add your, whatever graphics you're going to put up, you're going to upload it. And so, you know, ha working a full-time job, I had finite time to play video games in general, mm -hmm. and I was starting to grow a little bitter towards Minecraft that part of that limited time was going towards a game that I had been playing for so long and I was ready to move on to something else. And uh, I thought I was being really clever when I named the channel Raw Plays That Game because my plan was, all right, every week I'm going to play whatever I feel like playing, and so the title will be Rob Plays That Game Sleeping Dogs or mm. Rob Plays That Game Borderlands, and it would give me complete freedom, which is something I didn't have for that previous year because it was just Minecraft all the time. And I think there was a little element of, you know, when all people ask for is more of the same of that, uh, it, it almost magnifies how quickly you can get tired of it mm. because – it almost makes you feel a little bit more trapped. Like not only do I not feel like playing Minecraft anymore, but like, it seems like that's all people want anyway. So I'm, it, it almost makes it sound like you're bound to fail if you move out of that space, which can kind of crush you a little bit. Mm -hmm. At the same time, what's going on in the real world? What's, what's paying the rent for you as you, as you do these let's plays on the side? So at the beginning, I was still at Howcast, and and while that was my last how that was the last video where like I was making the video, mm -hmm. I was still producing for a while, and the channel continued to make uh like walkthroughs and stuff like that. Um, but I'd s pretty quickly into the life of the new channel, I ended up switching jobs. I I moved into advertising. Um, it was. <laughs> It's interesting. I, I would never have admitted it at the time because it sounded too ridiculous. But now that I can look back at it and say it, I don't know if it worked, but at least it didn't harm me. There was a part of me that took this advertising job because I did want to make YouTubing a full time mm -hmm. effort down the line. And I told myself, you know what? The economics of this platform is advertising and I want to learn more about advertising. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move into this space and I'm going to learn as much as I can about it so that if the day ever comes that I can quit my job and just do YouTube full time, I'll at least have the knowledge of how that industry works. And so I moved into that and it was a very bland kind of nine to five job. It wasn't very exciting. And uh, that ended up being very helpful for me because not having a creative job for the first time in my life, um, it, it almost allowed me to be more fueled up to add creativity to what I was doing at home. Like it gave me that motivation to make those let's plays mm -hmm. because if I didn't, I was doing nothing creative and I was just going to you know, become depressed. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the let's plays you start getting into about two months after starting the channel. Um, you start leaning into uh, leaning back into Minecraft a little bit, but with a very Disney twist. So tell us about what, what these sort of um, Minecraft servers were that had your interest. Uh, so those had existed for a little while before I got into them. And now that I look back at it, it really was just uh, something that I fell into out of pure, uh, not pure laziness, but I was trying to look for an excuse to not do what I was normally mm. doing. But uh, what what happens is in the game of Minecraft, you can play a single player game on your own or you can play multiplayer with other people. And there was this server at the time called MC Magic where a bunch of uh, players who are all Disney fans used the tools of the game to create a near one-to-one -one scale recreation of Walt Disney World. And I believe at that point they had 
They had most of the theme parks. They had a couple of the resorts. They had all these rides. And then using the tools of the game, the rides were actually functional. You can get on the rides and the little mine carts and they'd go around and you had the scenes. And it's very low fidelity because Minecraft is all about blocks. Mm -hmm. But it was there. And, you know, as they continued to build on it, they would add more and more detail. So they modded the game so actual park music would start playing when you walked around the park. And for someone living in New York, and again, still at a point where I couldn't go too often, it was a great way to kind of get that Disney vibe without, you know, paying to go mm -hmm. all the way down to Disney. And so one particular week I had Minecraft on my schedule and even though I was just getting back into it, I was already starting to feel fatigued with it. And I was like, I don't want to play Minecraft. I'm kind of getting excited for this Disney trip I've got coming up with a bunch of my friends. I just want to talk Disney. How can I do that? And then I remembered the server and I went, you know what? Why don't I go on MC Magic and I'll show off the server. I'll try and promote the server because it's a really cool idea. And I'll just talk about Disney and what I love about Disney and what I know about Disney. And I'll give people a tour. And it was not only the most fun I had making Minecraft content up until that point, mm -hmm. but uh, it ended up doing better than most of my other content, mm -hmm. my regular video game stuff. So I felt like I needed to keep doing it. And I just kept going to the different parks and expanding it from there. What other ways did you counter your theme park withdrawal? Because at the time, as you said, you're, you're not going to the parks as much as you'd like. Were there other things that you did uh, to sort of help um, curb that nerd need? Oh, for sure. Uh, especially working that nine to five, uh, there's a lot of downtime where I'm not talking to other people or I don't need to do anything audio related. So I had a lot of park music on, especially mm -hmm. when I had like trips coming up those weeks before a trip. I'll just load up any of the YouTube uh, channels that have it or or any of the sites that have it. And I'll just listen to ride audio. Uh, and then I was also very lucky that I have friends who are also very much into Disney, like my uh, one of my best friends, Christine. So, you know, we had this opportunity online because you know, when you and your friends are all working your nine to fives respectively, you're basically all on Google chat all the time. <laughs> uh, and so we would talk about, you know, just Disney, what, what we loved and, you know, what news was going on, stuff like that. And in many ways, it was like a precursor to the podcast we'd end up doing just in text form. And between the three of those, it would sort of keep me sated enough. And then of course there was always the books. I was always looking for whatever that next book was to read. So you then start mixing these books a bit into your content. Um, you kind of go a little bit away, not right away, but you sort of mix in like we're doing a Disney thing and here's a let's play of a Disney thing. And then let's try a Disney video game. Uh, you did this great sort of bit where you spun a wheel with all the Disney video games and sort of just played whatever came up. Um, but then the history portion you sort sort of want to play around with, uh, you go from kind of voiceover to video to presenting and vlogging in front uh, of the camera. Tell us about that decision. Why did you decide um, that you wanted to sort of become the face of Rob Play as opposed to just the voice? Um, this is, that's a great question because there, there's a story behind it that I, I'm always afraid to tell this story because it almost sounds like I'm making it up <laughs> because it almost sounds a little too cinematic, but I swear to God, like, the, the way this all played out just kind of happened almost like a movie. Um, those years where I was kind of experimenting with all these different formats, I like to think of them as like my identity crisis years because I really didn't know what I wanted to do with this channel. There would be weeks where it's like, all right, I need to chase what the numbers are telling me. Like Minecraft, Disney does well. I should only do Minecraft, Disney. And then there were weeks where it's like, you know what? The odds of me ever making a career out of this are are zero to none. I need to just do what I find fun. And so I even had periods where like I scaled back on Disney and was just playing video games. Um, and so I really didn't have a plan. And then uh, at one point, I kind of decided that as simple as it was, and this is really simple advice, but it's it's the kind of thing I feel like most people need to discover on their own is that when you're making content, you really should try to just make what you yourself would want to experience. Mm. And I, I came to this realization one day that I didn't want to watch anything I was making. Like I, I wasn't those Minecraft videos, like I, I'd skim through them just to make sure they were okay and everything. But it's not the sort of thing I'd go online and look up and watch myself. And uh, so one day I decided like, you know what, I want to make something that I would want to watch. And at that point, I was really interested in a channel uh, called Tom Scott, hosted by Tom Scott. And he uh, does very similar style videos where he would go to these different locations. 
he'd be in front of a camera. It'd be, you know, four to five minute long videos. And he would tell these different stories about history or interesting places. And what I really loved about them was that it wasn't this super comprehensive mini documentary. They were just short little, almost like um, a cocktail party stories that you could tell in five minutes. And so at one point, I, I just wanted to... I wanted to emulate that. And I said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a Disney version of this? Mm -hmm. And so January of, I want to say 20, yeah, it was January, 2017. Uh, I actually tried to make a few videos for his channel because something that he would do every year is he'd take a month off and he would highlight four videos by four other creators in those weeks that he was taken off. And so I, I wanted to make four that I could enter into this. Like he almost kind of treats it like a contest, uh, about the world's fair because I'm in New York, I can't really go to these different places, uh, particularly Disney mm -hmm. World. But I, being in Queens, we do have Flushing Meadows Corona Park, which is where the World's Fair was, which is where Carousel of Progress, It's a Small World, uh, Great Moments with Lincoln, and the Skyway, Ford's Magic Skyway was introduced. So uh, I dragged my girlfriend out to the park one winter. It was like snowing. It was awful weather with the camera. And I was like, OK, this is what we're going to do. I have the script written out. It was one of the first times like I was pre-writing scripts of what I was going to say. I'm going to say it all on camera. And then, you know, I'm going to cut to all this B-roll and make it like a mini documentary. And um, they didn't perform particularly better than any of my other content at that time. But it was the first time I looked back at a video I'd made and I was like proud of it. And I was like, this is something – I would watch mm. like I would look up and watch something like this. And so I I kind of told myself, even if this isn't going to be, you know, what drives the numbers, this is what I'm going to continue to make. And uh, a couple of months later, I actually was on a trip with uh, my girlfriend and I had this real almost bittersweet moment of clarity while I was on the trip where I realized, you know what, this is never going to work out like I'm never going to grow to 100,000 subscribers or anything. The channel's never gonna get that big. It's certainly never gonna pay my bills. This is only ever gonna be a hobby, and that's okay. But if that's what it's gonna be, if it's ever gonna only be a hobby, I need to just do what I find interesting mm -hmm. and what I enjoy creating. And so that weekend, I just told myself, like, all right, I'm gonna scale back and do one video a week. It's gonna be these kind of history videos that I've been enjoying and like dipping my toes into. I've been doing, I was doing a few at that point, but I wasn't like fully committed to mm -hmm. it. Um, and I'll, that's just it. I'll just have to live my life. I'll work my nine to five. I, you know, it wasn't an awful job. I'll, 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 I'll survive um, and I'll have this fun little hobby. And I want to say it was like the next week or two I made this water smell video that I originally almost wasn't going to make because I thought it was going to be too science focused. And that video ended up being the one that kind of went big and helped grow the channel and, and changed everything. And within a matter of a month, a month or two, I had gone from resigning myself to like never being able to do this for a full time gig and you know it'll only ever just be a hobby to oh my god this opportunity is in front of me I think I have to take this I need to quit my job and I need to do this full time. Did you find that transition easy to go from sort of you know the your videos get I don't want to say they're complex cuz you know it is sort of talking head b roll um, in, in the information, it's not, it's not like, um, you know, it's not super, super complex, but it's definitely more than just hitting record on whatever you're showing and, and talking over it. Did you find the, the process, the creative process of sort of saying like, all right, now I'm in front of the camera. I need to set up shots this sort of way. If I go to Disney, I need to get B-roll. Did you find that to be daunting or sort of like a, a welcomed challenge? Cause you did have that film background, I suppose. So it wasn't like super, out of your wheelhouse to do some of that stuff. But what was your sort of take on that when you were getting more involved? It was no joke. The most fun I had ever had <laughs> with the, the five years of the channel. Like it, it definitely felt like more work, but it was, not, it didn't feel, it definitely didn't feel daunting. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say at the very beginning, I did have this mentality of, I need to keep doing multiple videos a week. And I, I tried, I, I want to say there was like a week or two, I don't remember fully, where I tried to do a history video on top of other videos. And at the end of that, I looked back and I was like, I can't keep doing this. I'm going to like, I'm just going to just drive myself crazy because it was more time of a, it was more of a time commitment to create these like more, you know, 
curated videos. Uh, so it was a pretty easy choice for me to just scale back and just say, look, I'm going to do this one video. It's going to be highly polished and I'll use that extra time. How do you plan out what you want to talk about? Uh, clearly research is involved, but how much time do you spend doing research opposed to sitting on your couch and, and kind of driving yourself crazy? Cause you can't think of like the next video. <laughs> uh, it depends on the week. Uh, <laughs> It, there are definitely weeks where I'm like banging my head against the wall and I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing next week? I need a video. What am I going to do? And that doesn't get any easier when days pass and you know that the mm. time you have to make the video is shrinking. Um, a lot of it, I've, I've kind of gotten a little better with it now where uh, I'll actually set aside a day that is just dedicated to research for topics, mm. not even research for the script, but for the topic. And I will just browse old news articles or flip through books or just, you know, look for anything that would be inspiration. And, um, you know, I could probably make my life easier by just putting together this like laundry list of topic ideas because, you know, the Disney history, it's so rich. There's no shortage of ideas out there. But my guiding rule every week is it has to be something I'm interested in that mm. week. And so I'll have topics where I go, this is a great topic. This is going to be great for video. But I don't really feel like researching that this week. So I'm going to bump it a couple of weeks. We'll see then how I'm feeling about it. And I just need to find something that just really piques my interest. Um, and so there will be days where I'll spend the whole day just looking for something. And then, you know, I was just on the train a couple of weeks ago. And in a span of like 30 minutes, I came up with like four ideas for videos that I was really excited about. And it became a problem of like, well, which do I want to do first? And mm. those are always uh great gifts because then it just gives me more time to actually do the research itself, which I'll spend a few days on, um, and kind of start to write the script at the same time. It's almost like overlapping stages where I'll research, start to write, do more research as I'm writing. And then, you know, even as I'm editing the video, if there's a part that, you know, doesn't fully line up or I feel like I'm missing a little bit more context, I can just go back and do some extra research and then, you know, film or record whatever else I need to record and, and throw it in there. You, of course, edit all your videos and, and you, you seem to enjoy that process quite a bit. Um, how long does it normally take you editing wise to get a, an entire video together? Uh, I've done a few where I can cut them in a day. Uh, that doesn't happen recently uh, as much as I wish it would. <laughs> but I think that's more on me than the videos being complex. Uh, I'd say I, I usually cut them across two days. I'll uh, I'll spend one day where I kind of assemble everything. My trick when I was really on camera a lot was I would record the entire script with me on camera, mm -hmm. reading off of a teleprompter, and. The idea is at that point just finding all the relevant B-roll and plugging it in in the spots where I could. And then when there were moments where there was no relevant B-roll or I couldn't think of what to put in there, that's when it would just cut back to me talking into the camera. Uh, and so when I had that process, it was like very simple. And yeah, I, if I sat down and really focused, I could do it in a day. Uh, I try to take my time because I think part of the editing process is you want to sleep on it. It's almost mm -hmm. like writing. You want to give yourself time when you're finished to go back and reread it and see like, does this flow as well as it should? You know, uh, is this cut as well as it could be? Is there, are there po points where I'm watching this video where that B-roll is more confusing than it is helpful and I need to find something else? So, uh, even though I could rush them out in a day, I try to spread them out over two, sometimes even three days. How is diving into Disney history, which is clearly what, you know, a lot of your time is, how's that giving you a great, uh, like a greater appreciation for the parks in general? What is something that really sticks with you uh, through the whole process? I think the part that always impresses me whenever I'm researching any sort of story on the company is how, how much the people involved care about not just what they're doing from a professional level to, you know, being proud of their own work, but seem to care about like the legacy of the company mm -hmm. and Walt Disney. And it, it, maybe it's just me personally, because I came from a nine to five office job where I was just doing the work they told me to do. Like I wasn't personally invested. I wasn't like volunteering to stay extra hours just because. And so seeing the stories of people who put in that extra time and they put in that extra care, like that to me always wows me. And it, it's it's on every level. You see it with Imagineers, you see it with executives, but you also see it with cast members who are just working in the parks and, you know, they they just go the extra mile. And it really is the sort of thing that's it sounds like a commercial at this point, but it, it is the sort of thing that sets Disney apart from like all these other theme parks out there is that there is this sort of 
cultural history behind it that everybody can get behind and work towards. Now, your love of Disney and its history, of course, um, is sort of balanced by what I would call your ethos about the parks. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a question you once answered, um, and it is sort of... Uh, weirdly become a mantra of mine. Uh, it sort of helped click a few pieces in my head together. But uh, you might remember this exchange. I believe it was with the defunct land. Um, but you were asked what attraction should never be replaced at Disney. And I believe your response was, uh, nothing is sacred. Any, anything can go as long as, um, you know, the thing that comes after it is better. Talk to me about that a little bit. Explain Explain your thought process behind it. I'm grateful for the channel because I don't think I would have thought about this as much as I did and unless people were asking me about it. But ultimately, when I did start to think about it, I, I just the more I read about Walt Disney and and his sort of passion for the future and improving on things and plussing things and the way he approached Disneyland as this idea that will always change and evolve it made me realize that like he was doing it out of, out of this excitement that there's always something better around the corner. And I don't see why at Disney, you know, even though we have this historical appreciation of him now, I don't, I don't see why that should change, you know? And, and this is taking a big, um, this is taking a big leap to say this because, you know, nobody, I dare, I never knew him personally. And, uh, I think the people who would might say different things, I don't know, but like, I find it hard to believe that he would even look at attractions and go, no, we could never change this attraction. I, I do think there's reason to not like that idea. You know, obviously Disney is a place where a lot of people have a lot of memories and you tie, you know, a lot of nostalgia to it. And that's a very strong uh, feeling to have. And so, you know, it's something I even struggle with myself a little bit. You know, I hear about rides closing and the first thing I think of is all of my great memories with that ride. But I just try to remind myself that a new attraction is new opportunity for new memories. And you know what? They can get rid of the great movie ride, but that's never going to get rid of all of the memories I have from it. And, um, so I'm always like open to something new. That doesn't always mean everything they put there is always mm. better. You know, you get a few instances where it's a step back, but I, I feel like we should never punish, um, the, uh, I feel like we should never punish when they want to try. Like, I feel like that's something that should always be supported. That's something we should always like back up. And so I'm always excited when we're going to be getting new things because that's just a new opportunity for something awesome to come around. Um, and I still get to enjoy the nostalgia. And I try to think of rides that, you know, I like Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin. It's a fun ride. I wouldn't call it one of my favorites, but I would have never had the ability to enjoy that if we had not gotten rid of Delta's Dream Flight. Like, you need to get rid of the old to bring in new. And and so, you know, everybody's new favorite ride could be just around the corner. You just got to got to let it happen and see if see if it does happen. Now, what's strange about that thought process is in Disney circles, Disney Twitter especially, um, that's sort of like the most radical thing you can possibly believe when it comes to Disney. Like it's, it's, and I, and I don't say this about everybody, but you know, there is a big coalition of people that are, um, I guess for lack of a better term, traditionalists, um, Epcot should be this way. It's the way it always was. This should be this. Um, I can't believe they get rid of that. Um, do you think that, what's that balance like? Is, is nostalgia something that is now, um, being used to hold back sort of what theme parks can be? So I don't think, here's the thing. I, I don't think it is holding theme parks back. In fact, one of the things I always say whenever like the topic comes up is I'm kind of grateful of the fact that Disney doesn't bow to like all of this nostalgia, you know, when they want to change a ride, they're going to do it. They're there. Nothing's stopping them. And, and that's kind of like the gift that we have of these parks being such big phenomenons is that, you know, even if all the hardcore traditionalists did, you know, boycott Disney or stopped going because they were upset about a ride change, the, the company would still function just fine. And so that gives them the freedom to go after the changes they want to make. But of course that doesn't stop the community from still being upset about it. Um, and it's it's one of those things. Yeah, I don't agree with a lot of what they say when it comes to that. But at the same time, I totally understand where they're coming from, because, again, you know, when you love Disney and you're part of that community, it's not for some like cold outside objective mm -hmm. reasons. It's because you have that memory and you grew up with it or maybe even you didn't grow up with it, but you, you still have these memories that you've just created. And so, you know, I I. 
there are some times where I think it is just pure fear of change, but I also think there are a lot of times where maybe they think the the thing that's replacing it doesn't fit the ideals that they think the park should have. You know, Epcot is, I think, part of the reason that's such a big topic of discussion is not just because they're changing things, but because you could make the argument that their changes don't really align with what Epcot started as. Personally, I've always thought if you can change an area and if you can change the theme of a ride, I don't see why you can't change the theme of an entire theme park. But like I, I see where they're coming from. And I think outlets like Twitter are a really useful way for them to vent about that sort of stuff. Because like I said, Disney typically doesn't hold back. You know, I don't think there are a lot of instances where you're going to see public outcry actually stop them from making changes. So I feel like if, if something like, you know, uh, going on a Twitter rant about it is going to like help come to terms with it, then I think they should do that. You know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Uh, I just, my concern would come in the day where Disney goes like, you know what, you all said you don't want to see Star Wars land open. You'd rather the backlot tour come back. So we're going to do that. That's when it, that's when, you know, those opinions start to actually sway the direction of the parks. And that's when I'd probably uh, start to be a little bit more upset by it. So you wouldn't want Horizons to return? No, actually, it's funny. People ask me that they, or they assume because I've talked about how much I love Horizons. They go, would be that, would that be the ride you want back? And I don't think it would be a good ride if it came back today. It was great at the time. I have fond memories of it, but I watch ride throughs of it every once in a while. And that is very much a product of the Mm -hmm. 80s. Like now, if you want to take the spirit of Horizons, this idea of let's look at the future and what it can bring us and you make a new attraction that that contains that spirit, I'm all for it. Whether you call it Horizons 2.0 or you call it something different, I'm for that. But I don't think I'd want to see any closed attraction come back. A while ago, and you sort of mentioned uh, this earlier, you quit your full-time job to make the media creation what you do. Um, yep. That had to be, in some ways, a tough decision. Uh, so it was definitely scary. It was after that Disney trip I was talking about, I had made this water video that uh, ended up going, I would call like semi-viral. It wasn't, it wasn't super large, uh, but it allowed the channel to grow quite a bit. And, um, I, I was riding this sort of wave that came after it. I, I don't know how the YouTube algorithm works. I don't think anybody does at this point, but it was allowing the channel to grow. And I just had these moments where I was like, I was getting kind of tired of the nine to five. And I didn't know if I'd ever have this opportunity again. So I decided, okay, that happened to late summer of 20, 2017. I was going to take the next five or six months to save up my money, save up as much as I could. And then in January, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to take a year and I'm going to just try it. I'm going to try and turn it into a full-time endeavor. I figure if I can get the channel to this point just as a hobby where I'm you know, devoting work time after work to it, then maybe I can grow it even more if I'm devoting all of my time to it. And at first it was very scary. Like, you know, I I was pretty lucky considering the state of the economy and the way things were at the time. I, you know, I got out of college. I got a steady job. I had never been, you know, in a position where I didn't know where the next paycheck was going to come from. So the idea of quitting a steady job to do something creative where you don't know how it's going to turn out is definitely terrifying. But with every month as I like saved more and planned a little bit more, it became less scary because I stopped thinking of it as I'm going down this road I could never come back from and more of, all right, well, I'm taking a year off of work. I'm going to see if this works. And you know what? If it doesn't, I go back into advertising mm-hmm. and at least I get to live the rest of my life knowing I tried. And that to me was more important than, you know, the security of, well, I, I get my paycheck, you know, every two weeks. And so uh, it was something that went from scary. And then by like December, I was just super excited like I couldn't time was moving slower and slower because I was so excited to just get to that point because it's all I wanted what has that extra time allowed you to pursue that the full-time job kind of got in the way of uh it's definitely allowed for more research uh that was something that you know, a lot of my videos prior to quitting my job were just basically things that I could remember from, you know, books that I would then expand on by doing extra research. But now, like, I can take an entire day and just spend the whole day looking back at things to find something. Uh, and it also allows me to make, like, last second changes. Like, I've had a few videos where, um, you know, I'm halfway through editing and go, you know what, this isn't working. I need to go re record this or I need to, you know, try a different editing style and 
it, I would think to how back when I was working my nine to five job, I just simply wouldn't have the time to do that because I'd have, you know, my self-imposed deadline I have to meet. And so that freedom has been really nice. Like the most notable is I'll record my script in front of the teleprompter and I'll go back and look at it and go like, oh, I, this was a terrible delivery and I don't really, I look like I rolled out of bed and, you know, rather than just use it because I have to, I can take the time to just set everything up and re-record everything again. And then it, it's allowed me to like put extra effort into my podcast with Christine. And now we're like moving into things like merchandising with pins and shirts. And that's all extra time that I, I don't think I would have been able to do. And, you know, if I'm being honest on top of it, it's just allowed me some room to breathe because there was a time where you know, I was working the nine to five and I was doing the channel and it felt like I had two jobs and that was kind of a bit of a mm -hmm. struggle on my relationship. And it, this has given me room to like, uh, you know, not put that at risk anymore. You also, as you said, co-host a Disney theme park podcast, the Tomorrowland Transit Authorities, um, also known as TTA podcast for short uh, with your friend Christine. You recently reached 100 episodes. So congrats on that. Thank you. Uh, what made you to decide, uh, you mentioned that, you know, you had, were having conversations anyway. Was this a way to connect with, um, people, uh, and your friend that you don't get to see all the time like you used to, or what was the reasons behind uh, starting the podcast? I think that was a big part of it. Uh, I had attempted a podcast before that and it was just called like the Rob plays that game podcast. And it was a very low effort podcast because all I was doing was I was stripping the audio out of my videos. I would do like five per episode and it was just i thought was a way for people to uh enjoy the content without seeing the video part of it which later ended up being a real wake-up call to like well if the video part doesn't matter then you're doing yeah. something wrong the video part should matter um and that kind of floundered because it just wasn't worth it. And uh, so people had asked, like, oh, when are you going to ever come back with the, another podcast? Are you going to do the podcast again? And, you know, like I said, yeah, Christine and I, we would just talk every day about Disney. And she was just getting into YouTube at that point. So, you know, we were talking about YouTube. And we thought, you know, this could really help us in multiple ways uh, all at the same time. You know, we get to, yeah, stay together as friends. We both live in New York, but surprisingly, the way New York <laughs> is sometimes, you it could feel like you're really far away. Um, we get to talk Disney every week, but we could also hopefully turn this into like a promotional tool for our channels. And, you know, if people come in through the podcast, maybe they learn about our YouTube channel that way. Uh, and also personally, for me, it was a way of sort of fulfilling a request that I had leaned away from because before the podcast, one of the series that I did on my channel was the Disney Q and A mm -hmm. and it was people would send in questions and I would answer them. And I kind of just dropped that when I went full history. Uh, but I did like the idea of like just bringing up random topics every week and talking about it and going back to what I just said, like that realization that, well, the video and those videos didn't really matter. It could work as an audio format. So to me, that was, this was also a new way to kind of bring that back in a way that made more sense. And we started it as a pure hobby. We, we didn't put in the sort of effort that I think a lot of podcasts do at the beginning where, you know, you, you want to foster this growth and you have a plan for it. We were just like, all right, let's talk about Disney every week. And if this ever gets boring or old, we'll stop. And it just never mm -hmm. did. So what's next for Rob plays? Are there other areas that you hope to get into? Um, you know, are there things beyond history that you want to tackle? Uh, what, what's the future hold? Uh, I'm hoping eventually that I can get more comfortable uh, get diving into history that's less Disney related. I've already done it a little bit and I, I've always considered them like little tests to see how people react. Uh, the first one I did in January was the history of pressed pennies. So I was like looking for content that has some relation to Disney, but the, the meat of the history itself has nothing to do with Disney. It's long before it. And I just recently did a video on the Hotel Del Coronado, which was a big inspiration for the Grand Floridian, but I made most of the video about the hotel itself. And so I, I kind of would love to do more of that. I love this idea of telling the story of these these different pieces of history because it's just really fascinating and uh if i can find a way to grow that bit a little bit more i don't know if that ever means maybe another channel one day that's just general history or just getting comfortable with doing you know this sort of disney adjacent history and doing more stuff like the hotel del coronado but that's kind of where i want to take it next i, I love the format and i want to keep playing with that format uh but i just want to have a little bit more room to play with what the actual content itself is. Well, Rob, thank you so much for being on DreamFinders. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
And that's it for this episode of Dream Finders. I'd like to thank Rob for being my guest. And if you'd like to check out all the wonderful content he's creating, check out his YouTube channel, Rob Plays, or his podcast, The Tomorrowland Transit Authorities. Our podcast artwork is provided by J.P. Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by WDW News Today, the world leader in Disney Parks news. Read all they have to offer at wdwnt.com. Dreamfinders is hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Tell your friends about the show, and don't forget to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It really does help get the word out, and we appreciate it. If you or someone you know would make a great guest on this program, feel free to email us at dreamfinders at wdwnt.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it. Thank you.